What is a monument? A monument is something that is built. It is the end product of time, energy, labor, and money. A monument is built to commemorate someone, something, an idea. Many great monuments in human history have been roads. Roads are connectors. They organize people and places. A road can be the only thing that marks a landscape where there is no other trace of human presence. And it says, we were here, we were going somewhere. With a price tag of $128.9 billion, the U.S. interstate highway system is the most expensive public works project in American history. It is the great monument of the post-war American automotive empire. And like all monuments, the interstates tell a story. In the old days, before the turn of the century, this was the American road. The old road was not only a road, it was a way of life, slow and often rough. But there were things you wanted to do that couldn't get done on the farm. If you were interested in machinery, for instance, or wanted to tinker with engines that ran on gasoline, the country was no place for you. You had to go where other men were doing this kind of thing. Train was late, of course. You could have slept another half hour. The people who lived in the city stayed in the city. They walked the hard pavements till their feet ached. If a person were well healed, he took a cab. If a nickel was all he could afford, he took a streetcar and got there an hour later. The fastest thing in town was the fire engine. Bicycles were all the rage. On Sunday afternoons, you could pedal out past the city limits and see real trees and grass and hear a bird sing. That was fun. As long as your legs held out, you could go wherever you wanted, right up to the end of the road, that is. A few miles out of town, the paving ended, and from then on, bicycling was no pleasure. accepted the end of the road and turned back. But the bicycle wheels had a greater destiny. In Detroit, a man named Henry Ford, who had left the farm and come to the city to tinker with machinery, was making what he called a quadricycle. It looked like a buggy, only it had no shafts for a horse to be harnessed to. The horsepower was going to come from a gasoline engine he'd made himself. That night, history was made. The street was never the same again. Just being able to drive a car was enough, but pretty soon the novelty wore off and people began to get angry at the bad roads. So they started to make the roads better. In every state all across the nation, men and machines went to work.
rutted mud gave place to smooth ribbons of pavement, wide enough for two cars to pass each other. And the roads became longer. They pushed out in every direction. And down every road ran the Model T, panting and quivering, always eager to go farther. Early highways were more for leisure driving than they were for getting around, because the earliest cars were so expensive that they were only toys for the very wealthy. But beginning in the 1920s, visionaries in the auto industry began to push on the American public and government officials the idea of a paved and connected America. American automobile owners had a right to drive somewhere, and so they argued that roads were a public good. Building better roads would be good business for the auto industry, yes. Hey, you. But it would also be good business for the country and create thousands of new jobs. General Motors Pavilion at the 1939 New York World's Fair did more than anything else to sell Americans on the idea of planned superhighways. GM called their exhibit the Futurama. The 35,000 square foot series of models told the story of a day's journey in an American city set in the year 1960. From an airplane vantage point, visitors watched miniature cars, future GM models for sale, cruise along a superhighway running through various landscapes to a cloverleaf interchange, and finally into a central business district where pedestrians walked on sky bridges over non-stop traffic. Each guest received a pin on the way out that proclaimed, I have seen the future. Local governments bit the hook and began to focus long-term development around the highway. Good evening, viewers at home, and welcome to Who Wants a Highway? Here's your host, the father of the freeway himself, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Our two contestants are big cities, one uh, quite a bit bigger than the other, with a real drive for driving. One is Car City, USA, and the other drills the oil that keeps our gas tanks full. Today, we're here to find out why they have both got big dreams for modern highways. During the Great War, Detroit's factories produced more weapons and planes than anywhere else in the country, or even all of Germany. Lots of new people came to work in the factories, but come V-Day, the city was really worn down from heavy use. City planners noticed a frightening pattern of people and businesses leaving the city for places where rent and labor were cheaper. The city's government has come up with a solution called urban renewal. They plan to clear large, unused, and unattractive portions of the city that they call blight and replace those areas with civic projects. How are the people going to reach their new downtown, you may ask? On a brand new modern highway system. Let's not forget, Detroit's factories make cars now. Cars mean jobs, and if people have nice places to drive their cars, everyone is happy. The American dream is alive and well down in sunny Houston, Texas. This old town wasn't much when it was founded in 1836, but since striking oil at the turn of the century, the population has only been going up, up, up. Now, at a moment of national prosperity, this city is looking to carpe diem, y'all. First on the list of big changes is fixing up its roadways, which are awfully out of date. A first-class freeway system is a great way for Houston to step out onto the national stage as a modern metropolis. Now, without federal assistance, the state and local governments of our competitors are going to have to pay their own right-of-way and construction costs. Let's see how they do it. Detroit starting off with a gasoline tax. Houston's made an explicit freeway tax, but oh, that just got shut down as unconstitutional. Detroit's adding a car licensing tax now. Both are selling revenue bonds on a mission to the state, to the citizens. Let's take a look at Houston's newspapers. They are publishing positive freeway coverage. And did the City Chamber of Commerce just organize an official highway week? Houston is really trying to get taxpayers on board with this project. They love their freeways. Oh, but what's this? We've hit a standstill. It appears our contestants have phoned friends. Why, it's a direct appeal. 
Members of Congress, we need our freeways urgently. We're trying to fund them. We really are. But the cost is too high. We, the mayors of the United States, joined by our friends, the producers of our nation's fine cars, its concrete, its rubber, and electricity, we implore you to see our freeways as we do, as a national goal. Thank you. We'll be back after a brief message from our sponsor. In this century, America has become a nation on wheels. We ride on wheels to work, to shop, to play, to go about any place we want to go. We depend on wheels to bring us the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the things we use. But when we depend on wheels, we depend also on highways. Your children will have a better country to live in because of these new roads. Well, they'll be able to drive anywhere safely, even from coast to coast and without fear of accidents, because the people that are planning and building these new roads are, are conforming to standards such as controlled access and, and wider pavements, more lanes and wider shoulders, and, well, all the things that Mr. Jacobson's film talked about. Well, it seems to me we're just being blind to the facts, just as we're being blind to our children's future. Can't you see that this highway means a whole new way of life for the children? and a way of life that we have a chance to help plan and, and to build. When we left off, the cost of expressways was just too high. Here's what the federal government came up with during the break. Through a series of federal aid highway acts between 1944 and 1956, Congress came up with a plan for a 40,000-mile interstate and defense highway system. Their goal? To connect the principal metropolitan and industrial areas around the country. The groundbreaking act of 1956 created a gasoline tax trust fund and allowed the government to shoulder 90% of all interstate construction. You get a high. You get a high. <laughs> Even the grim depression of the 30s could not stop the powerful forces that had been set in motion. Got the blue sky above me Got the asphalt below me I got a 55 Ford pointed west Where nobody knows me Not yet I got places I've never seen I got a full tank of gasoline And I'm waiting I'm just waiting for the light to turn green the interstates created a new industry of domestic tourism by making the vacation available to anyone with a car. Auto companies took it upon themselves to teach and excite the American public about limited access highways. Sponsored videos were distributed to schools, neighborhood clubs, and television stations teaching drivers how to navigate long distances or pack for a family trip. Gas stations distributed maps and guidebooks. Magazines wrote articles about travel. All of this new media presented a very deliberate image of who was meant to experience the new American space. And by visualizing this, the message became very real to people who absorbed it. The road was a contact zone where Americans from different regions and walks of life interacted, and so it gave a pretty accurate temperature reading of the nation's social climate. That climate did not welcome all travelers equally. One guidebook offered by SO Gas Stations, AAA, and the U.S. Travel Bureau was the Green Book 
Negro Motorist's Travel Guide. The Green Book listed Black-owned and Black-friendly businesses in each state so that African Americans on the road could avoid humiliation or danger while traveling during the era of segregation. One woman whose family had experienced this difficulty worked as a cook for President Johnson. Hearing her husband emphasize, there's no place on the road we can stop, moved the president so much that he fully committed to the fight to end racial inequality. When he signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, all Americans received the guarantee that they could travel without fear of discrimination. The Green Book ceased publication in 1966. Other aspects of American life were changing too. Houston was transformed. The creation of highways expanded the city's metropolitan boundaries to over 450 square miles of extremely low density development. The city organized its growth around the freeway, where major highways went, single family tract housing followed. Businesses set up shop along the route between home and office. The highway became the city's main street. You had to drive everywhere. There were very few sidewalks. The station wagon was the suburbanites' exoskeleton and the movable extension of their air-conditioned home. Although the skyline was often visible from the freeway, the shape of the city was connected by individual patterns of life. The civic spaces were based on consumption. Detroit maintained a clear city border, but the highway created the idea of a suburban threshold. With easy access, people who lived out of town could now come into the city to work. In fact, the new roads actually gave many people a reason to move out to the suburbs, where they could have a new home with a backyard. Life would be more peaceful, and they would still have the benefits of the city within easy reach. Now, we don't want to give up our home any more than anyone else wants to give up theirs. But anybody with any sense at all knows that this system of roads will be a good thing for his country and for all of us. It's something we really need. Well, if we want all these things, the highway has to go someplace. Now, the routes are selected by experts who have nothing against us. They don't even know us. They just design the road to go where it'll do the most good for everybody and for the overall plan. Well, it happens that this road goes through our place. And I think we'd be pretty small-minded if we tried to fight it. I'm sure we'll be given a good price for our place and we can build a new house. I just don't think that any family or business or individual has any right to hold up anything that'll be good for his whole community and for his country, too. During the 1950s and 60s, at least 17,000 Detroit residents, most of them inner city urban poor, were displaced by expressway construction. Civil rights activists charged that the displacement disproportionately targeted African American neighborhoods. Despite its high population of immigrants, Detroit has been afflicted with incredible racism, with historical tension and violence of whites versus blacks. Between the turn of the 20th century and the late 1960s, city and federal housing segregation policies forced all black Detroiters into specific neighborhoods. Two of the largest were Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, which ran along Hastings Street downtown. Essentially, we kind of had our own community where we, we had our own grocery stores, we had our own drug stores, uh, churches. The mayor who led the charge on urban renewal policies had been elected on a racially charged campaign that played up white fear of integration in residential neighborhoods. When he was criticized for being inhumane in neighborhood clearance in 1949, he replied, Sir, 
There have been some inconveniences in building our expressways and in our slum clearance program. But in the long run, more people benefit. And that's the price of progress. I recall my parents saying uh, something that urban renewal meant black removal. And I wasn't sure what that meant, how that impacted us. And they talked about Hastings Street. At Hastings, same at Wine, coming up to Woodward here. Uh, and what was called the Black Bottom area, downtown Detroit, uh, where my dad, who was a musician, would play. All of that was going to be affected. And that had been a large part of our culture. Residents protested the construction, but even with the aid of the NAACP, they were unable to stop the city's plans from coming to pass. Demolition sometimes took years after the city's original announcement for clearance. Eminent domain hung like a cloud over homes and businesses, artificially lowering the property value so that when residents ultimately left, they received little in compensation and were unable to afford equivalent property elsewhere. Well, sir, before too long, the freeway was completed. And it all happened pretty much the way Mr. Gray had said it would. The useless, dangerous traffic jam was gone, and Hilldale owned its own streets again. The people who had been inconvenienced for a short time were all in fine shape. And above all, Hilldale itself had become a part of progress, had taken its rightful place with all the other active, forward-looking communities that have always made our country great. Although the architects of the motorways had hoped that the highways would halt decentralization, companies continued building corporate headquarters in the suburbs. Even shopping had left the urban core. J.L. Hudson's was Detroit's iconic department store, a beautiful early skyscraper where shoppers might find any luxury they wanted. In 1954, the store opened an outlet branch about 20 minutes outside the city in a proto-mall off the side of Major State Highway M10. Northland Center had free parking and the controlled environment meant protection from bad weather or litter or vagrants. For suburban customers, it was an easy drive that never hit downtown traffic. National media covered the mall's opening with the tagline, the future of American shopping. Sales did so well that the outlet put downtown Hudson's out of business. It closed in 1981. Formerly empty landscapes were transformed. Franchises flourished because as Americans drove further distances, predictable experiences and convenience were attractive. If you didn't want to stop but had to, at least you knew what you were getting and where you could park. The only way you could tell you were leaving one community when the franchises started repeating and you spotted another 7-Eleven, another Wendy's, another Costco, another Home Depot. By the early 1960s, counter-cultural criticism of government bureaucracy, foreign policy, and authority at large grew to include protest against the drive-in suburbanization of America. When Jane Jacobs published The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she brought national attention to a trend of neighborhoods being bisected to make way for freeways, using the Cross Bronx Expressway as an infamous example. The problem with highways, especially the really big ones like the interstates, is that their magnitude requires top-down planning. 
When considering a road that runs across the entire country, it was easy for planners to forget the impact the structure would have at street level. Jacobs articulated that orthodox post-war city planning had been incredibly harmful to the people it was supposedly meant to serve. But while she successfully organized against freeway construction in Manhattan, her victory with city planners was the exception. As a rule, urban portions of the interstates moved thousands of neighborhoods and communities out of the way for cars. The interstates were not built all at once. The entire network was not completed until 1991, nor did the same set of engineers design every road. Some interstates were built from existing state and city highways, while others defined a brand new relationship. Houston's highways are elevated. Detroit's run sunken beneath the ground like concrete rivers that were cut into the city. Detroit was not originally a highway city, but it became one, and many of its residents feel that tension by way of nostalgia for a connected geography. Much of the downtown feels as though it's been surrounded by a concrete moat. You cannot ford the freeway. The roads are almost unnecessarily wide. All right, folks, we gotta make the roads nice for the commuters. Let's put some trees in. Hmm, yes, genius. Boom, done. My neighborhoods are gone. And I know progress comes and that things have to change and that nothing gonna stay the same forever. But when you travel Europe and you see the, the things that have been there for hundreds of years and you realize that this is still a very young country, you still really like to feel like there's something left that has value, that's historic. And I felt that loss. I drive down trying to find Hastings and I don't even think there's a sign that says the word anymore. Nineteen seventy three. As nationwide gas prices skyrocket and traffic congestion is at an all-time high, cities look beyond the highway for solutions. Mayor Joseph Aliotto of San Francisco testifies to Congress. What's good for General Motors is not necessarily good for the country. And in the case of transportation, what has been good for General Motors has actually been very, very bad for the country. The Federal Aid Highway Act is amended. Cities are now free to reallocate highway trust fund money towards public transportation. San Francisco, Atlanta, and Washington, D.C. build subway systems. Houston does no such thing. Houston's population doubles during the OPEC oil embargo when it becomes the nation's chief fuel producer. With double the cars on the road, traffic congestion is considered the nation's worst. The city government decides to double down on freeway construction. The belt gets bigger. Again, the citizens of Houston have chosen the freeway. It's simply the Houston way. If you drive toward Houston from western Louisiana, you'll see persistent signs for a curious creature. Don't pull over yet. You're almost there. An oasis exists beyond the border. This beaver is named Bucky, and this is his truck stop. Bucky's is the most beloved gas station in the country. It's big. Bucky's has luxurious bathrooms, and you won't have to wait in line. If you want a drink, we've got options. Your right to choose is valid. Bucky's is a homegrown Texas franchise. Whether you're at Bucky's, Baytown, Bastrop, or Beaumont, you can buy the same snacks, gear, home goods, apparel, and souvenirs at every location. A Bucky's cap says, I'm proud to be a Texan. Don't stay too long and come back soon. There are no picnic tables, and your dog will probably be uncomfortable. And that's the last big thing you'll see for the next 50 miles or so. Until then, the interstate carries you to the next threshold of civilization. The designers of Futurama had estimated that by 1960, there would be 38 million cars on U.S. roads. The real figure was double that. As of 2016, there were 268 million vehicles registered in the U.S. 
The vision of the future came to pass. The monuments were built, and in many ways, they define the American landscape and way of life. But the empire has changed. In Detroit today, there are plans to take out sections of the highways. Town hall meetings are being held, and perhaps this time around, the planning process will come from the ground up. What is the future of the American road? It may behoove us, planners, taxpayers, drivers, and citizens alike, to look first to the past before we move forward. Each road has its own story, and what is concrete but a billion grains of sand. Growing up in Brooklyn, shit, I thought that everybody talked this way. Race on Rock, Kim, and Run DMC, so I thought that everybody walked this way. We fresh, we chill, we deaf, we ill. It's just some things I was taught to say. And every Saturday morning, I watch cartoons with a bowl of frosted flakes. Then the puberty came, started hitting them cuties with game, and the truancy came. Uh, started cutting and not just class, I was coming off fast, I was new to the game. Uh, music playing on TV, courtesy of video music box plus. Knew a lot of hustlers going OT, coming back with a new hip hop life. E40 holding down the Yay, and W in the LA. Outcast from the A Town, way down in Houston, they play the UGK. I walk and talk kind of fast, I'm thought of as a New York kind of rhymer. But most New Yorkers got family in South and North Carolina. LA is little Alabama, they walk and they talk with a country of grammar. You think everybody up South Country is always started calling them bammers. Down South when we buy them hammers, down South when we sell them drugs. Down South where life is cheap, but they quick to fill you with them slugs. It's nothing, I'm from New York, but I got country cousins. It's nothing, we stay connected by the slang we bustin'. When it's simply put, you can't pit me with a spit, gonna set everyone free. I'm an underground king, nigga, Pimp C free. What up to my man, Bobby? What? It's nothing, I'm from New York, but I got country cousins. It's nothing, we stay connected by the slang we bustin'. The things we bustin', the game we hustlin', the things we cuttin', the flame we cuppin', the lanes we snuffin', your name is nothing. Growing up in PA, I knew nobody out there talk like good. Nothing but that country slang. What up, dawg? What up, cuz? Late night you see us, see us, boy, this mad dog whining weed. The thing about Texas hip hop, especially Pimp C, was the production was very musical and very much rooted in the sound of where they were from, in the melodies and in the blues. 